On today's podcast, one of the most popular content creators on YouTube. He would later translate that success into several multi-million dollar companies, including a clothing line, a whiskey company, and a coffee company. Oh, how am I going to sit with a guy who has a whiskey company and a coffee company, both two things I gave up and I desperately want? He wasn't always a YouTube personality uh, and a businessman. In fact, when he first began to make his videos, he was a military contractor for the CIA. Before that, he served five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan with the elite Special Operations Force, 2nd uh, Ranger Battalion. And then he comes home. And oh, by the way, before that, uh, he was in the Botany Club. This guy is an American war hero, a CIA contractor, a serial entrepreneur. I love this. I love this. Today, Matt with 1T Best. We all have an idea of what our dream job looks like, but someone's not just going to hand it to you. Odds are you're going to need at least a bachelor's degree to make that dream into a reality. And I know it's hard to go back to school while you're working. I did when I was 30, and it's tough. But that's why I think you're going to love Ashford University. For starters, convenience and flexibility. Ashford University's online bachelor and master's degree program allows you to learn at your own pace, and you can study wherever and whenever you're the most comfortable learning on a schedule that works for you. You can also just take one course at a time. Ashford University's six-week-long courses allow you to take one course at a time while still being considered a full-time student. And there's no standardized test required. The SAT, GRE, the GMAT, other standardized test scores, nothing is required for enrollment. And Ashford University is fully accredited by the WASC Senior College and University Commission. So get on the road to earning your degree and making your dream job a reality. You just have to enroll. Do it right now at ashford.edu slash Beck. And start your degree today. Ashford.edu slash Beck. <laughs> So let me ask you this, because you're in your videos, you're a tough guy. I mean, right? Uh, but you, I mean, you were in the botany club in high school. <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. That does not scream tough guy. That's, that, that's, uh, that's yeah. like the guy I could have beat up in high school. You absolutely could have beat me up in high right? school. So what happened? You know, it, it's weird. I grew up the youngest brother out of six. And so I was not bullied, but, you know, definitely held oh, yeah. my hands behind my back and mm -hmm. beat up on my brother. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and then high school. <laughs> wait, I, wait, wait. <laughs> Explain that to people from today's American culture, how you could possibly be happy. It was it was tough love. You know, they weren't they weren't, you know, punching me in the face and breaking my nose. They were just, you know, trolling me like older brothers should. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a, a healthy competitiveness mm -hmm. between siblings. So. Um, and yeah, in high school, I was just a really low key, quiet, I'm, I'm a very, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but quiet person. I, I'm not an extrovert by any means, I'm an introvert. And uh, so I kind of put on that persona now, you know, I, I think that I'm a teddy bear with kind of a, a tough uh, outer shell when I have to be, you know, I don't have- Where did that come from? I think just my raising and then who I was around, you know, I always had older brothers to kind of run the show. So I just kind of set, set back and tried not to create any drama. I'm just, but I'm trying to get my hands around botany, right? Elite fighting force. Where, when did, when did that, when, when did you go, you know what, I'm, I'm an elite fighter. When did that happen? Really, uh, you know, my two brothers, uh, when they graduated Marine Corps boot camp, and I saw, the, I saw them sitting in formation in their uniforms, I was just enamored by the professionalism and how stoic they looked. And that really, transpired into my want to join the, the military and that, that they graduated on 9 11 did they not yes they were supposed to and obviously 2001 um changed that changed that but knowing that they were essentially going to war right after that i looked at them and i'm like man these guys are my heroes and they really inspired me to serve my country and i, I come from such a long history of service my, my dad was a marine uh, my, my grandfathers and great uncles were in world war ii um, my dad's dad was in the in vietnam so 
a bunch of service. And then finally I watched Black Hawk Down and I was like, oh. Army, Army Rangers, these guys are so cool. I want to be like that. And it's funny, my brothers to this day say, we thought you were going to fail. You're a little dweeb. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was too stupid to quit. So wow. it's, it's been the case of most of my life. So, uh, because if I had this pivot point to where now I, I don't have, I have older sisters who also just beat the snot out of me. I'm the youngest. Uh, and, uh, but there at no point would I be watching Black Hawk Down going, yeah. I mean, I watch Black Hawk Down now, and I'm like, no, <laughs> definitely not. Not me. Um, the, the pivot point uh, for you, when was it? Was it that moment, and how long did it take you to how, – how did you – let me ask you this. Okay. What's the dumbest thing? What's the most Glenn Beck thing you would have ever done when you were a private? When you first got in, what's the worst, dumbest thing you ever did? Uh, you know, I'm a jokester, so I always played by the rules, but, you know, I was the guy sometimes in basic training, they'd call the uh, formation to attention, and I'd make like a fart sound and make the formation laugh, and we'd all get smoked for it, but... Right. Uh, which is interesting because a lot of people said, you can't make jokes, you have to take this so serious. And it tended to be the guys with a sense of humor that worked through the hardest situations. Right. And I've always kind of carried that with me through everything that I've done. You know, when it's time to be professional, you're a professional. But man, life's short, there's no dress rehearsal, we're born terminal, like you gotta freaking enjoy this right. one chance of life we get. So you went to work for the CIA after Rangers. What'd yes. you do? Um, do you have to kill me and if you tell me or <laughs> no i'm not I, I i tend not to like get too much into it just because yeah, the, yeah. the organization but not that i did anything super cool but it, it was a very uh good experience for me because when i got out of the military my transition out was insanely difficult you know i was just on my fifth deployment as a ranger team leader and master breacher you know kicking in doors every single night and getting into gunfights two months after that deployment i was in los angeles california dealing with you know, progressives on, on a college campus that had no clue about what real life is, what real sacrifice is, you know, and I had just been bearing friends and, you know, putting bandages on other brothers. And then I didn't go through what you, you, you went through, but I've traveled. Right. If, if you think this right. is bad, yeah. you know, I was just talking to my, uh, my daughter last night and she said, dad, a friend of ours, um, they grew up in, um, in Iran, and in 1979, they escaped, and uh, they just got off the phone. Their dad is still there. They just got off the phone. One family member was just shot uh, in a protest, but he wasn't really protesting, yep. and she was talking about how they, how they can't even say that on the phone. They had to have a private burial. It was, they can't go back into Iran. They can, but they don't trust it because people are being thrown in jail. And she said, that's what life is like. And I said, that's what life is like a lot of places. <laughs> a lot of places. And that's what life is going to be like if we just, yeah. let's have a revolution. Are you insane? Insane. Yeah, I call it the American life lottery. You know, we used to, kind of a dark joke, but we'd be driving uh, when I worked for the agency and, you know, our low pro vehicles and you look around and see some poor, poor 50 year old guy pushing a cart, just trying to find some rice to eat for the day. And it's kind of very unfortunate and tragic circumstances that are associated with humanity as a whole, but we've developed this epic tribe in America and we have to stay together and united or we're going to lose it and we're going to regress back into. So let me play devil's advocate. Please. Believe it or not, I used to do like like stand up. Okay, I, I believe to, that. Yeah. yeah, I used to do I a lot of comedy. My whole show was comedy for a long time. You can't do comedy and survive in this if you want a real political voice. And one thing that came to me is because it is always turned around. If you're making a real impact. They will turn it into whatever they want to turn it into. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter. But eventually it does because they create this thing where everything is out of context, where you're dividing people. Even if you're saying, I want people to come together, you're the problem. You're dividing right. people. Have you ever thought of that with any of your stuff? Because mm -hmm. you're, I mean, you're joking. It's clearly a joke. Right. But you are also like, yeah, we're going to come over and kick your ass, you know, because you're whining. Yeah, I guess if you have a dense perspective, that would be dense, meaning meaning 
and, and uneducated where okay. you, you're not seeing the the value. You're just looking at it at face value. You're mm-hmm. not understanding the cultural impact it has on a specific community. I mean, America is so great because it's so diverse. And so we have all these different pockets of belief right. systems, political spectrums, sexual preferences. Hey, all good. But comedy is comedy. And what we do is satirical in sense. And the good work that we do is very unifying. And I think it's why for me, comedy has got so stale is because mm. comedians are so terrified to make a joke. I mean, Dave Chappelle, even Joe Rogan goes on about that. And, you know, if Louis we, CK, all of them, yeah. all of the good, smart ones, right? The smart ones are, are willing to say it now, but there's very few. Well, they George want, Carlin would hate this society. Because yeah, they don't want to take the risk because right. then, you know, maybe a venue won't book them because they made a joke that offended, you know, the, the guy serving popcorn. Again, it's, it's in satirical nature and it's a comedy show. And that's what my platform is. I just saw a new poll out uh, with uh, those under 30. What was it? 56, 58, somewhere in that percentage. Believe that if you say things that are hurtful, um, it is, it should be against the law. No protection for that. If you're hurting people's feelings and jail time. Are, are we just going to like light the first amendment on fire then? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we already? <laughs> God, I'll leave, <laughs> Bill of rights barely exists anymore. Yeah. That, that, that's so crazy to me. I mean, it, it's, there's something different than, you know, turning someone into a victim and being not hurtful, but uh, aggressive in nature, but statements that are satirical in nature, that's, that's just, those are words. Isn't that what, isn't that what your brothers were doing? And didn't that make you stronger? You just said. Absolutely. I mean, I've never, if we keep giving out participation trophies, no one's going to know what it feels like to lose. Guess what? If I haven't lost so much in life and in business, I wouldn't know how to be as happy as I am. You know, it's just like sometimes the rain makes the sunshine feel good. Mm -hmm. 50 cent lyric, by the way. (laughs) Um, But it's true. And I think that enduring, you know, complex problems in life sets you up for such a better mental happiness. And that- You know what has meaning. It has meaning, absolutely. And if you just live in this like fake bubble of, you know, everything's perfect when it's not, it's it's not reality. That's something else. Let me go back to your, you're in, you're in college. Okay? Yeah. You come back. H- how did you, how did you deal with that? I walked off the campus and quit. And I went to online college. Best thing you've ever done, I bet. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just didn't really, I didn't have the emotional intelligence at 23 years old to kind of <laughs> chill Stuff out. That back in. Yeah, yeah. I had some, a yeah. lot of growing and maturing to do. So I, I realized that, that it was a bad environment for me. And, um, Fortunately, I went through a really dark time during that period, you know, like terrible alcoholism, just didn't care about anything. And I finally had been sober. What's that? How long you been sober? Oh, I'm not sober. I just learned how to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that you can have a glass of scotch at night and not drink the whole bottle. Really? You know, I have not mastered that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm, I am uh, not willing to give that a shot. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was actually a gentleman, one of my best friends in all of my life, Trey Bullock, who, who, who kind of saved my life. He called me when I was sitting in the gym parking lot, and I think he just had that spidey sense and, mm-hmm. and said, hey, man, let's get you back doing stuff that you love. And he actually kind of opened the door for me to work with the agency and getting back into that tribal, like-minded, you know, with, filled with purpose that I purpose. felt. It, it was, it's, it was, cr- it's crazy that, that millennials are dividing us so much and they they just think everybody has to be put in this box or in jail or whatever when what they're really saying is i want purpose in my life yeah and finding purpose is serving other people not shutting them up serving them going and doing something bigger than you agreed and they're being sold this package of goods that just leads to total emptiness and that's the challenging thing for me because I think, you know, I'm technically just made the millennial list in 33, but they're coming from a lot of them from an empathetic perspective yeah. where they truly want to have purpose and make a good change yes. in the world. Yes. They're just going the wrong way about mm-hmm. it, you know, mm-hmm. especially I've seen in, in when I went to college and it's only got worse with the professors, they're just like feeding them this crap and convincing them that, you know, you have to attack people if they don't agree with you. I mean, I have 
super liberal friends that think completely different than me, but we still get along because we see the things we have in common, not the things that we, you know, and then we can talk about it. Yeah. And we have better conversation. I just, a guy who was my mortal enemy, apparently, I I had to look him back up when he was like, can we have dinner? Because I want to talk to you about, and I was like, I was supposed to be pissed at you because I don't remember. I had to look it back up and and Google our names. Um, And apparently we were mortal enemies. Well, we had dinner and we we started to talk because both of us were in a place to where I don't hate you. You know, I don't hate you. Um, and we don't agree on anything. Right. But those are the best conversations the you best. can have. The best. Because you learn. You're all of a sudden going, wait, well, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that. Right. Oh, I see why this, when I did this or said this, I see why you reacted that way. And, right. and you learn something. And you, that's how you make a lasting difference. Well, there's also this, I think, like a culture of it's not okay to be wrong. I mean, we've all been severely wrong in our lives, whether it was an argument or a perspective. And I feel at this point in day and age, it's like when you get someone, you kind of put a cat in a bathtub where they find out, wow, I'm kind of wrong. They just start attacking you. Well, you're this and you're that. Instead of being like, it's okay to be wrong, dude. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. Now let's develop a better thought process and thinking forward and, you know, creatively problem solve. It's just like entrepreneurship. If you look at a shipping issue and go, everything's screwed. Well, that's not how you resolve something and put the mission forward. You have to, you know, define the issue and then solve it. Just like in politics, I'm sure that I know nothing about, but um, culturally speaking, you know, uh, I think that's what we have to do. And people have, have to be more receptive to being wrong and listening. Are we getting better? Worse? Have you seen any change in that in one direction or another? I don't know if I pay more attention these days, but it seems like it's getting a little worse. Mm. I mean, especially with the election coming up and all that, you know, just everything gets so heated and people just start shaming and blaming. Where does that, where does that put us? How, how I mean, any You've traveled the world. You've seen troubled areas before. Any idea what we're headed for? How long we have to wake up? You know, I, I honestly don't know that answer. I think it's super complex, but it, it's, it's not a good road forward. I know that for sure, because the more divisiveness you create, the more polarizing the two sides become, which the contrast becomes wider. And then, you know, it's escalation of force. Arguments turn into riots. Riots turn into whatever i was talking to a friend of mine the other day and we were talking about the idea of you don't talk about religion and politics in public right and it's it's not because we wanted to avoid arguments it was because the american way is i don't care yeah you vote for who you vote for you worship the way you want to worship no skin off my nose Exactly. Now we don't have that in common anymore. Right. We, we, you must comply. You must do these things. Right. So what do we have in common now? Uh, I would say a hyper quality of life that we have to be a little more appreciative of because that's what gives us the perspective to understand how fortunate we are as a society, especially now. I mean, yes, we've had a, a war going on for, for two decades, uh, pretty much. It's crazy. Crazy. You know, but we don't have that kind of global threat that we did back in World War II. And I think that that's why that generation was so united because they understood what, how it was possible that our way of life could completely end. We had that. If the up. Japanese wiped us out in midway, where does that leave mm-hmm. us at? Like there, there were so many different battles that and, and people were terrified. And now it's just, you know, some college student doesn't think about the war in Afghanistan. I'm, half of them probably don't even know there's a war still going on. Mm-hmm. We had that growing up with um the cold war Mm -hmm. i mean i remember as a kid being terrified we're all going to be dead from nukes you know and it it, there is something uniting it's kind of it's kind of like the 9 11 9 12 thing though right do you have to have that mortal enemy i pray we don't but i don't know how to resolve that and i don't know the answer to it because you can only tell people something so much before they you know they just don't believe in it so you left college, then you started clothing line? Uh, well, yeah, I left college, started my uh, online bachelor's. So I got a bachelor's in liberal arts, which is pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> while I was working for the, uh, the agency, I started making satirical little videos. And as a way to kind of monetize the platform back then, I uh, just 
we and my business partner started making two, three shirts. So if we get 500 extra bucks, we could buy a new camera at mm. Best Buy or wherever and, you know, increase our production value. And that kind of snowballed. Because I think it was a very interesting thing that we did, or at least were part of, is the military culture back then, there wasn't a lot of fun, humorous entertainment associated with the veteran community. Mm. It was all very tactical and you know kind of chest beating which there's nothing wrong with that but a lot of guys in the military we have a macabre sense of humor that's how we deal with mm -hmm. going out night after night and seeing mm -hmm. death and so we kind of took that perspective like hey we'll we'll be professionals with firearms but let's make people laugh let's make the jokes we did in the team room and that really was the foundation of all the entrepreneurial dreamers i have um do you i'm sure <laughs> Let me talk to the botanist in you. Oh, okay. please. The, nerd, the, botanist. The, the, the nerdy kid. Okay. Um, ever watched Downton Abbey? I haven't. Mr. Selfridge? I know that one, yes. Okay. Um, they both are from the time of World War I. Um, okay. And you see what World War I did to society. I mean, those guys came back. Nobody had ever seen a war like that. Almost every horse in Europe was, was slaughtered. Yeah. Um, it, it just was beyond understanding and recognition. So we didn't see it. We had never seen anything like that. Then World War II happens, and it's the strong, virile guy who comes back, and he can't talk about it, right. you know, because that's just not what a strong man does. Then we go to Vietnam, where you can't talk about it because it was shameful. Right. Our, our veterans... Um, are in trouble with suicides and it's, it's horrible. But in some ways, it's kind of the golden era for veterans compared to the past. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm in hyper agreement with that, to be honest with you. I think that there's some issues that we have to deal with on the individual level as yes. far as people that probably shouldn't have gone to war or were subjected to such traumatic situations that they need to seek help. So we always have to be proactive mm -hmm. in supporting them. But my main thing that I try to focus on now is the kind of civilian narrative that I've heard a lot, which is a guy like me that comes back from special operations five deployments, like, oh, he's got the PTS, you know? And I'm like, no, we're not pill popping depressive guys. We're, mm -hmm. I just came back and now I wanna live the American dream, be an entrepreneur and, and have a family and, and just live my life and see what the next chapter has to offer. But we've absolutely created a better environment for veterans. I mean, especially looking back at Vietnam and how poorly we treated oh everyone is terrible. 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 And, and there is, there are a lot of very successful veterans that have come back and they, and I think in the same way you do, they're just like, this is all bull crap. Yeah. I'm just going to do it. Yep. I, I, people have asked me that before. It's like, does your military experience translate into your business um, acumen per se? And 100%, because again, I didn't grow up in tile life, grew up pretty poor, worked for everything, started working when I was 14. And so now it's just get the mission done, figure it out and be so gritty. What has changed? Because military guys, Generally, if you look at it from a conservative point of view, if you're a member of the military, you go to Washington, you become the biggest kind of statist, you know, because you're used to a cog in the wheel of this giant government machine. Right. Um, but how is it that we're spitting guys out that are such entrepreneurs? Because I think uh, with, with the advancements in technology and social media, you know, it's pretty easy to have your voice heard. And a lot of it, it's why we have like a 40% um, veteran hire rate at Black Rifle Coffee is because their, their skill sets are so brilliant and they have so much diverse skill sets. And mainly it's usually the, their perspective on work. They work. You know, they don't come in and complain about stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the small stuff, they come in and they get to work and they're really good at it. So I usually like to hire a veteran that doesn't have a skill set for that specific job. And then we'll train them on job training because I know they're going to work their butts off and they're going to have a good attitude every day and just be thankful for where they're at. So, so if I was, if let's say I'm at the bank okay. and you're coming to me for a loan and, uh, and I'm looking at your paperwork and I'm like, okay, black rifle coffee. I'm a second amendment guy. I'm not offended by that black rifle cup and you're making it in, uh, Salt Lake City? Yeah, one of our main roasting hubs in Salt Lake City. It's probably the least 
consumed beverage out of yeah. all of the states. Because you're Mormon, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. Mormon. We don't drink coffee. I know. <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah, it was very interesting how that all transpired. Uh, essentially, Evan and I, when the company was getting going, we kept looking around the state where we should be geolocated, where we should put the company. And then one day I'm like, we can talk about this all day. I'll just drive up to Salt Lake and we'll plant the flag. And to be honest with you, Salt Lake City has been very receptive. They've mm-hmm. been amazing to us. Um, even people that don't drink the coffee come in and buy merch. So. Yeah, they're, they're an entrepreneurial spirit Yeah, uh, there. And I actually lived there for uh, two years. Did you? North Salt Lake, yeah. Yeah, did you like it? I didn't mind it, honestly. I, I missed, <laughs> didn't mind it. <laughs> I love Texas. You know, you yeah, show yeah, up to yeah. Texas and get yeah, a, a yeah, driver's yeah, license yeah. and they hand you a Glock. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Um, uh, I, I, by the way, I just have to say, as a former coffee drinker and now not, you piss me off every day <laughs> because I walk by the, the coffee pot and it smells <laughs> so good. It smells so good. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. No, no problem. Um, what, uh, what changed, if anything, in your cultural or political mindset from the time you joined the military, the time you left? What did you learn? That's fair. I would say I didn't learn a lot while I was in because I was so absorbed into what we were doing and being a professional at my job and keeping my team alive. It was retrospect. It was looking back. It was looking back, I think. Um, And I've definitely become more and more conservative year by year because it didn't, a lot of it didn't matter to me. But then now when I look how we're treating people coming out and, you know, love them or hate them, I got to give it to President Trump for the amount of support he's pouring towards the military. And it's actually, it's, it's a godsend, I think, for a lot of the dudes to look out for him. And I just wish whatever political spectrum, left or right, more people cared about the men and women they're, they're sending to war. And so that's really where... I think it's so immoral. It's hyper-immoral. It is. You got these people that sit in an ivory tower and they're like, ah, send the boys. And yeah. they send off 19-year-old men and women to just get slayed. And right. As if it's nothing. It's disgusting. And, and it's, it's also immoral to... Uh, to live in this society and have 20 years of war where our soldiers are places we don't even know. What yeah. are we doing as, you know, we, we were up until World War II, a country that didn't believe in standing armies. Right. And it was Eisenhower that said, by the way, you go down this road, everything's going to change. He talked about the military industrial complex. He talked about the State Department yeah. and how that was going to, and it's all happened. It's all happened. Right. And we just kind of like, oh, I don't know. What are we doing? Well, yeah, because I don't think not, a lot, not enough people care. And so it's just kind of unbeknownst to them. It is what it is, which is very unfortunate. You, well, let me, I don't, I don't, I don't want to stick you out because I think a lot of things can be, I think fame and fortune is a drug. I think fame and fortune is uh, one of the most dangerous things you can give to a human being. Agreed. Um, horrible. You can all of a sudden just buy into it and you are, then you start to hold on to it. It's just ugly. I've heard you say war can be a drug. Yes. How? Um. There's a very interesting gentleman, and it gave me so much perspective. He's a former um, special operations guy, and uh, his name's Tyler. And he had this whole statement about lack of PTS, the lack of post-traumatic stress. That was very interesting because, you know, when I wrote my book, I personally, just me, individually speaking, never had issues of what I went through and what I saw. Mine was always the sense of purpose. And that's what I had such a difficult transition coming out because... I missed it. And when I was in, I literally convinced myself I was going to die. And my, me- my mentality was, well, time to kill as many bad guys before I die. I was convinced that was, and it was why I was kind of, you know, I wouldn't say fearless, but a, more aggressive in nature for getting my job done and keeping people safe. And um, so when you lived past that, I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was like, got in the car and someone said drive and I had no GPS, I had no clue, mm-hmm. clue where to go. And so that's something that I've, I've found my new purpose in life is ensuring that I don't have, hopefully can help 
other you know 23 year old dudes like me that get out of the military and have some form of inspiration and an understanding that there is more life to live there's even more quality of life to live outside of the military so be thankful for it but don't define yourself in the rest of your life through that you know four six eight years that's as a chapter move on and write an epic book don't don't write one one cool chapter can't that be said however for millennials most millennials that they they're getting into a car and they they want to serve they they have good intentions they want to do the right thing right. but it's a purpose uh, it's a purposeless life you know social media and all of this stuff yeah, it's, it's just, just it has no purpose well that's that's the very difficult time and you're saying how how fame can be a drug you know i think the social media complex is very scary and terrifying you know you can go on there and see 12 year olds dancing for a like it like on their instagrams and doing all it's just it's weird and bizarre to me and it's like i'm kind of terrified to have kids because i'm like oh man it's, hard. it's a weird world to bring them into and it, it's a very surface level environment we've created with most social media because they're willing to act immorally or do anything for that comment and like for that self-validation and it's fake affirmation it's it's there's no substance to it you know they'd rather get 60 likes on a comment, then have that one great interpersonal, you know, relationship yeah. with someone that loves them, their yeah. character, not their blonde hair or their, their muscles, you know? And it's hard, you know this, because you have 70 million likes on, and 70 million views on, on one of your uh, YouTube videos. When you have one that doesn't perform well, right. it automatically, right. you automatically go, well, what did I do different? What? Right. And if you're not really self-aware, which I haven't met a teenager that is, <laughs> if you're not really self-aware, yes. you start mutating for the algorithm. Yep. It's, it's very, very funny to say that. I've heard comedians and other people say that never read the comments. And I, I try not to do that because thankfully I love the art of production and film and movies. And so I selfishly do it for myself because I love the process from mm -hmm. script to screen. And then when I put it out, I don't really base it, base it off of the performance, like on numbers, but am I happy with the project? Could I have done it better? And I don't think, like you were saying, you have the emotional intelligence at 15 years old when you put out a video to understand that it's okay I, that you didn't get as much views as your last one. Right, and I don't know if you can grow the emotional intelligence you're kind if of, you're in that bubble. If, yeah, if you're in the bubble, it's kind of a sounding board and you're just bouncing back and forth, so, yeah. Um, you're talking about I love film and everything else. So where, where, like, what's a goal? You're 50 years old. What's yeah. a goal? What do you, what do you see as this is? That's what I really want to do. Very interesting question. Um, yes, I love film. I think two things that are really my pass forward are becoming a better executive for my company and you know, being a better business owner and business partner. Hey, so let me ask you on this. I see you here. Okay. And then I see your videos. Uh -huh. And I know the difference between, I know that you can be, honestly be, two different people. You can be that performer <laughs> yes. where you're just like doing it and yeah. it's fun and you can be this. Right. Yeah. But most people don't, <laughs> they they look at you and like, wait, what happened to my guy? What happened? <laughs> yeah, is, is this is any of is any of that toned down because your business is going way up? I don't think we've toned down really at all. I mean, we put out. I mean, you. Oh, me. Uh, I think uh, depending on the media, and certain times I have to speak to a different audience, but all of it is me. I'm not mm -hmm. a politician. I don't fake stuff, but. You know, when you have those kind of aggressive, more fun natured videos, that's just an extension of my satirical jokes that I write. Like, man, I want to troll these guys who get spill a glass of milk and cry for 10 days. You know, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like for other people to see the more professional side of me, that it's not all, you know, whiskey and, and guns and jokes and all of that stuff. There's a lot of work that goes into creating an enterprise and employing over 200 people. Can you just t tell me again how you drink whiskey? 
How did you get past that part? <laughs> I've never gotten past it. And we, I watched your wife lock it I up still, and just I, get the three ounces. Geez, and you're good. <laughs> geez, I watch I watch people now all the time. I see, and it hadn't happened to me in a decade at least. But I see people, and they they have a glass of whiskey, and that's my poison. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks so good. That yeah. looks so good. I got I got out of it before. I mean, Jack was you know. Maker's Mark was something that, that was fancy. Nice. Uh, those two. Uh, and then I got out of coffee. And it's like, I, I got out before there was good coffee. <laughs> before, before, you know, when it was still. You knew what good whiskey good was. Good whiskey was. I, I will indulge in those um, bad behavioral patterns for you. Thank you. So I drink Thank great you. coffee and great Thank whiskey you. quite often. How did you break that? Because uh, you used the word alcoholic. Yeah, I was for sure. But I think a lot of that stemmed from the position I was in life. You know, innately, I am a very driven and motivated guy. I love to work. I love to just create things. And when I had nothing to create sitting stagnant in the water, essentially, the only thing I could do to ski- escape myself You're was Sherlock get drunk. Holmes. <laughs> Are you familiar with Sherlock Holmes? Well, of course. Yeah. You know, the, the real Sherlock is a, a heroin act. Oh, really? Yeah. And he doesn't... Uh, it's called the two percent solutions: cocaine and heroin. And he, uh, uh, when he's on a case, he's completely clean. Interesting. But until he finds a purpose, he's taking heroin. Life has absolutely no meaning to him. Well, fortunately, I've never touched that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I mean that was kind of the position I was in, and so that's why I kind of needed a good support system to pull me out of it. Um, I want to go to. Uh, chicken and the egg with your with your um ads because you're not you're not really running ads you're not running ads right um uh you know you do something and then at the end black rifle coffee right completely counterintuitive unless you are yeti or um uh patagonia when you are those companies you realize no i'm I'm a lifestyle. They're coming to me because yes. they want to go hiking. They yes. want to go do these things. They, they, don't, they will spend that on a cooler because it means something. Right. Was this, did this play a role at all in your head or did it just come naturally? I'd say a lot of it came naturally. But again, I think something I've been very fortunate with is I'm a selfish comedian. I do things just to make myself laugh. And when I started getting into production, I wanted to do a, a style of content that I had not seen out there. And fortunately that started catching wind. And what I really want to add value to our customer base is not only like the greatest coffee, but how do we give them more of a value add to participate in the mm-hmm. brand, to feel they're a part of a sense of community and a sense of give back. And you know, I use the term a lot, vote with your dollar. And I think at this day and age, it's really unlikely for brands to be as transparent as we are. But when you engage and participate in a brand, you know exactly what we stand for and what we're about. There's American flags all over our, our business. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people are concealed carrying legally, you know, mm-hmm. so that's just who we are. And if you don't like it, go buy, go buy coffee somewhere else. You know, I don't need to, the whole world doesn't need to be our consumer. And, you know, being in the CIA, you probably knew this, uh, maybe to some degree, but we are... We're all categorized now. We're all just, just through algorithms, we're just all categorized. Right. And you go into a grocery store and an algorithm can tell you, you voted for Trump, you voted for Hillary, just by the groceries. Really? Oh yeah, you didn't know that? It just is. by the groceries. Consumer data is getting scary, scary, scary. individualized. <laughs> it, it is, it's like with 90%, like 96% accuracy, just on what you buy at the grocery store. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. That is crazy. I, and have you ever been to uh, like Nantucket or um, Martha's Vineyard? Um, I've been by Martha's Vineyard. Okay. Uh, yeah. Don't go. Uh, you go <laughs> to Martha's. Is that Napa Valley, right? No, no, no. That's up in uh, Massachusetts. Okay. Okay. So Martha's Vineyard is, is the elite, elite Democrat liberal. Martha's Vineyard started out as a God place with, with real conservative values. But now I walk 
the streets of Martha's Vineyard, it's not comfortable, okay? <laughs> Nantucket, which is just, just down the road a spell, or down the water a spell, is conservative. Interesting. For Massachusetts, okay? Right. It's crazy. When did we start dividing ourselves like that? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. I think they should build a cool little bridge with a nice <laughs> little bar table just like this and share wine once a week. And, uh, you know, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing and have some good conversation. <laughs> so when did that, but when did that, and isn't the brand, I mean, because right. I agree with you. I mean, I want to serve the people I'm never, going to, I'm never going to be able to get the people who hate me who don't even really know me. They just, they see this and they're like, oh, well, I know what that's all about. Yeah, I'm the same way. Right. Right. But doesn't that play into that shopping cart that is completely different where we don't share anything? It could be. Um, I think... There, we kind of segment our brand positions like me. I just do a lot more satirical stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Black Rifle Coffee, we stand for America, the Constitution, and being a patriot. That's right. very divisive. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. I don't either. think so. People, when they hear those words in 2019, might think it's divisive. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we've had every sexual preference, religious preference, political preference work in our house. As mm -hmm. long as you're not offended by the American flag and you put in hard work and you believe in the American dream. I've said that 20 times in this podcast already. Super simple to me. I mean, we've had like one of the huge progressive work for us and just believed in the mission, was a sweetheart, great person. Mm -hmm. I've had super progressive people. No problem. Work for me, but they didn't hate America. Exactly. And they believed in the Bill of Rights. Right. That's, that's all it really takes. It's pretty simple when you think about it. I don't know why we've made it so complex. Yeah. <laughs> so you said that you want to uh, be a better CEO. Yeah, I'm executive vice president. Evan gets CEO title. Okay. He's, he's the man. He's smarter than me. Well, you want to be a better executive. <laughs> executive yes. Okay? So you want to be a better executive. But I keep hearing you talk about, I'm a comedian, or I do comedy, and I do film, and I like the process. Where is that in being a, an executive of a coffee company 20 years down the road? Well, that's, that's a good question. Cause that's where I have about two personalities in that sense. I want one to be the 40 hour a week executive and the other one to be a 40 hour a week, you know, film director and all that. Uh, you know, I've done film before I've acted a decent amount, but the older and older I get, I'd love to participate more in the production side of it and have the newer guys, maybe in veterans come up, coach them and, and direct movies. I'm probably going to direct another movie in 2020, which I'm really excited about. About what? What's the story like? It is kind of like very interesting film. It's going to be kind of like Deadpool meets I Am Legend, you know, <laughs> so like zombie apocalypse with some, some satirical humor in there, but then also driven solely by music because I'm obsessed with music. So everything will be scored very theatrically yeah. and, and musically, which I don't think has been done. I think each one of those has been done on their own, but the combination of them all. Maybe some Boz Lerman in a way. Yeah. Not the same way, but... And then I'll, I'll probably be in the botany club in the movie, <laughs> you know, selling trees and you know, hamburgers like I used to do. In is that pod. what you thought you were going to do? What did you think no. you were going to do when you were, when you were in the botany club and you're a skinny, you know, beat upable kid? Yeah. What did you think you were going to do? I don't think I knew, to be honest with you. But it's a very in interesting um, entrepreneurial journey I've had because for the Botany Club, I used to uh, grill hamburgers once every two weeks in the quad. And, you know, I'd go to Costco and I'd work all the cost of goods out and build a spreadsheet and, and see how we could increase profit margin. And I didn't even know at the time that this was like setting the stone for me in, in business years and years later. But I don't think I knew what I was doing. So. Is there a... Uh a marriage in your future is there a i'm currently married to a show me it's on there and i forgot my ring today she's gonna, okay. kill, she's gonna kill me for it <laughs> that's what you went it's on there it's on there <laughs> it's on there <laughs> okay no i live with my uh, beautiful wife and i have two dogs so noelle is her name and she's a sweetheart and it's her birthday friday so i gotta wow. do something nice for her oh wow. good i've been married uh just over like three years yeah how'd you guys meet uh the instagrams you know as the, really? as the millennials say, I slid into her DMs, but she wasn't having it for a long time. I had to be very convincing in my did argument. She, did she know 
Not really. Um, she worked for a gun store, so she's kind of a, a gun gun nut in a good way yeah. and uh, is an avid coffee drinker. So I make fun of her all the time that uh, she married a, a gun drinking uh, coffee yeah. guy or gun yeah. toting gun coffee, coffee yeah. guy. So I, I think it's um, my wife. Uh, I, I was kind of doing this with my career when I met my wife and everybody thought it was over and I thought I was going to have I, I was going to give this talk radio thing a chance. I'd done 20 years in top 40 radio and I was so sick of it. And uh, so I thought I'd give this a chance and nobody thought it would be successful, including me. I mean, I was like, well, you know, maybe. Right. And uh, we met and got married and it, she didn't think of success like that. She thought I was going to be, I don't know, uh, you know, a chef or something. Uh, and so she's not really into it. You know, she's just, she's a mom and, uh, and a wife and does her own thing. And she's not into the celebrity part of it. It was the best blessing of my life. I was actually just going to ask, ask you that question. I went to, when I first date, second date ever with my wife, we went to a birthday party with my friends. There's this like big famous band playing there and a whole group of people. She didn't care about any of it. And that's kind of how it is. It's been a great counterbalance to my it's life. It's really good. Because I had previous relationships, maybe like you, that were very into it. Look at me, the trophy likes wanting to be on the arm mm -hmm. everywhere. And it, 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 it's very, very challenging as a public it figure. It will, and it will pull you, it will pull you apart. I yeah. mean, success is hard. It's success, hyper challenging. It is. You're under the microscope every single day. What's the hardest part about success for you? Privacy at least as far as public figure wise, privacy, for sure. I'm a very introverted, like I live in acreage and hide from everybody. So I go out and do what I do. And then um, I, I don't like to be overstimulated. And it's so weird when, you know, if you like Google your name, people know dates and births of everything. When you got married, oh, your yeah. wife's hobbies, and yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's creepy to you me. You walk into places or into an airport and all of a sudden you see everybody look at you and then they look down to their <laughs> and they got googling you to see that's if that's him. it that's yeah. him i'm sure you get that way more than me but it's it's uh it's a blessing and a curse fortunately for us we have such an amazing supporter base like a lot of people that support us are veterans or patriots and so they usually come up and thank us for the mission that we're doing it's nice think that, yeah it's wonderful because it does give you the sense of community and it, and it revalidates that purpose because sometimes you know you can sit at two in the morning working like, why am I doing this? I could just get out of here and go live in an island. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, you see that uh, message come in that says, hey, I watched this video and you saved my life. And I, you know, rekindled my relationship with my wife and got in the gym over a stupid two minute video. I, you would never have thought it would have had that profound impact on somebody, but for some reason, right place, right time, it did. And it's amazing, isn't it? It it's, gives me chills. It's the most yeah. humbling, awesome thing it I've is. ever experienced. It's really hard not to say, I. Well, that's why I planned it. I mean, I, I was no, not at all. I, I didn't. Yeah, I'm not going to lie on that. No, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> you really want to say that? Well, yes, I am that genius. Yeah. But no, I bluffing. I set I out no at idea. the age of 15 in the Botany <laughs> Club, and I'm going to change people's lives. No, definitely didn't. Um, let me just ask you some political questions sure. here, um, and that aren't. I don't think they're real political. Um, uh, all to do with the military. Uh, we are in a position now, and I don't know if you know uh, much about this thing that's happening. It's really what I think the, the impeachment thing is, uh, is all about. Um, we have a policy in the State Department of, it's called Civil Society 2.0. And it is training revolutionaries uh, with our government money, training them, then telling them just wait till the right opportunity. And when we see the right opportunity, go and the government is overturned we've done this with bad governments we've also done this with really good governments um should we as people be fomenting revolution around the world it's a very loaded question i would say i i, I usually stem more towards like isolationism you know like not we can interject where we can help but you know Proxy wars and all that are so complex. And the problem is, is we, it's so hard to define what the third and fourth order effects of that will be. I mean, look at Iraq with Saddam Hussein. I mean, we created an insurgency out of there, lost look a lot at, of American lives because yeah. of it. And, and then it's like 
all you always come back to was it worth it and maybe it's easily defined easily defined retrospectively but to just go start having proxy wars and overthrowing governments that's that's a way above my pay grade and i think most people that are making those decisions too i uh i used to be much more go get the bad guys right. we have a responsibility you know go get the bad guys and it kills me what chi- what's happening in China. I mean, with the Uyghurs and the concentration camps that they have there and, and what's even happening in Hong Kong. We lose Hong Kong. Taiwan is gone. That whole thing just spirals out of control. And it becomes very, even darker than it is right now. But I don't want to be involved. Yeah. I mean, I find myself in this place to where we, we can't do that. You know, you can't give people freedom. You can't. They have to earn it. They have to find it themselves. We can, we can help, but we can't lead on that. And I just, I just feel like every time, we, every time we reach out and we do something, because it's the right thing to do, yeah. with the exception of the big ones like World War II, it, we make it worse in the end. We yeah. make it worse. Historically, we have, yeah, in, in certain circumstances. So it's a hard one because, you know, you can define a moral argument on either side. Well, are we going to let these, you know, human transgressions and, you know, things happen here? Or are we going to go risk lives to intervene, which consequently, consequentially could turn it way worse? It, so do you believe in, because you were in a private army. Mm-hmm. You believe in private armies? As far as being like a contractor? Yeah. Um, or, or let me say this. I do not want the United States government um, going in and freeing slaves in China. Okay. But if there was a Ross Perot and he is a private citizen, wanted to go in and help rescue slaves out of China, I don't necessarily have that problem with that. You know what I mean? It's not the government's responsibility, Hmm. but maybe it's me and my local church or whatever that went, you know, we got to go save these people. Right. Is is there a place for that? Yeah, that's that's a very good question that I've really never thought about. I mean, I think in certain circumstances it could work. I look at, you know, Kurdistan and some of the former veterans that were going over to support the Kurds and and the travesties that we're having Mm -hmm. over there. And it's hard not to absolutely agree with them, you know, as they're getting shot at from ISIS pulling, you know, children Mm -hmm. out of rumble. Mm -hmm. Of course I agree with that, Mm -hmm. you know. So, eh, yeah, I guess it could work. I just don't know the functionality of it and how it would. What's the world look like in 10 years? Hopefully a great place. (laughs) I'm going to leave it at that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. 